Welcome to Spirits Podcast, a boozy dive into mythology, legends, and folklore. Every week we pour a drink and learn about a new story from around the world. I'm Amanda. And I'm Julia. And this is episode 105, Rangda. Yeah, I'm actually really excited about this myth. It was sent to us by a listener, which I am always excited when listeners send us suggestions for stories and they're very good and they have a lot of information in them. So um, I am excited to share it with all of you. I'm also excited to share my uh, laughter, my life, my joy with our newest patrons, Sarah, Tony, Noel, Francis, Rebecca, and Sean as well as our supporting producer-level patrons, Philip, Julie, Christina, Eeyore, Sammy, Marie, Josie, Amara, Neil, Jessica, Phil Fresh, and Deborah, and of course, our legend-level patrons. Oh my goodness. Stina, Jordan, Jess, Sarah, Zoe, Sandra, Audra, Mercedes, Jack Marie, and Leanne. You all are the... You're not the turkey to our Thanksgiving dinner Mm. because the turkey is potentially the worst part. You are the very good stuffing with the gravy on it and kind of mixed in with the mashed potatoes. That's you. That's you right there. Yeah, you are the uh, Trader Joe's brand cranberry sauce mixed in with fresh orange zest Mm. because you add some needed acidity, lightness, flavor, and color to our lives. We love you for that. Speaking of delicious foods, Julia, tell me about the cocktail you were drinking. Uh, So I made us a cocktail called an herbed and spice. Uh, Think of it as kind of like a mojito, but with basil and lemongrass instead of mint, and then just a hint of chili on top. I've been getting pretty into spicy drinks. It's never been one of my fortes, but I had a like tequila mezcal based um, jalapeno involved Mm, drink recently, and it was so good. So I'm I'm getting into that chili floater. I'm into it. Heck yeah, I'm glad. Spicy drinks are my fave. Do you know what else is my fave, Amanda? What? So I just started a new podcast and it's called Wild Thing. Sorry, I didn't start it. You're in it? Or are you listening to it? I'm listening to it. Because I was like, Julia, I know that you act in a lot of podcasts, but for me to hear on air that you were doing a new one would be pretty surprising to me. Just a little bit. But yeah, if you liked our episode way back about Bigfoot or just like cryptozoology in general, check out Wild Thing. Uh, It is about a former NPR reporter who found out that her cousin was one of the leading Bigfoot experts in America and started following in his footsteps. Are these real people? These are real people. This is a nonfiction podcast. Pulling out my phone to subscribe right now. Do it. It's very good. Also very good are two sponsors for this week. Of course, you know Skillshare, the online learning community that we love so much, where Skillshare.com slash spirits will get you two months of premium membership to all their classes for just 99 cents. But did you know that we are also sponsored? Welcoming to the show, Mrs. Fields. Mrs. Fields herself. (laughs) My close personal friend, (laughs) Mrs. Fields, the cookie company and snacks, all kinds of stuff. You can get 20% off your order at mrsfields.com when you enter promo code spirits. But we'll tell you more about that later. I'm very, very excited. Do you know what else I'm very excited about, Amanda? Um, Is it our two live shows happening the weekend of PodCon 2 in Seattle? Yes, it is. And I'm so excited. (laughs) We are putting on two live shows because the whole Multitude fam will be in Seattle in January for this podcast conference called PodCon. We figured why not put on two amazing live shows with us, with our friends, with special guests. It's going to be so great. And if you're in town, whether or not you're going to the conference, you are totally welcome. Go to bit.ly slash Multitude in Seattle to get your tickets. I cannot wait to see all of our friends and listeners there while we drink and also tell spooky stories. And it is an intimate venue. So if you can come or if you're in Seattle, I would suggest buying tickets sooner rather than later. That's bit.ly slash multitude in Seattle. Yeah, we might sell out. (gasps) Be careful. Sold out. Get those tickets now. Love it. Get them. Get them now. Well, without further ado, enjoy Spirits Podcast episode 105, Rangda. So, Amanda, I'm about to leave for vacation tomorrow as we're recording this. Whoa, me too. Yeah, look at us. out doing some vacation stuff. We're so cool. I was looking through my topics in order to figure out what I wanted to do this week. And I saw an email in our inbox from a couple months ago because sometimes I save emails that interest me and then I fully read them later. And so this topic that we're going to be talking about today was recommended by listener Andrea, who suggested in an email that was titled, quote, Cool motive, still murder, the feminist myth. Yay, I love it. 
Which, if you are making a recommendation to me using Brooklyn Nine Nine references, I am definitely going to pay attention. That's, know your that's audience. The secret. <laughs> so she pitched the story to us as having quote almost every folktale trope the spirits team is into: creepy, unrepentant, powerful villainesses, witchy things, parental child bond and confrontation, possible connections to a historical figure and to the goddess Kali, the fact that it's still part of a living belief system and a symbol of the eternal struggle of good and evil. Hell so yeah. you know, you know I wanted to learn more, Amanda. Good wreck, Andrea. So this myth is about Rangda, who is the widow witch and demon queen of Bali. Ah, so good. I feel like I don't even need to say more. That's like, we're, we're good. We're sold for the episode. Let's <laughs> no, go into I'm, our I'm discussion here. at the end. <laughs> I'm here. I'm ready. So she represents chaos or adhama and makes up one half of the traditional dance pas de deux with barong, who is a protector spirit who takes various animal forms uh, and represents order or dharma. And we'll get into a little bit more about barong later, but I really wanted to start with like just wrong this whole thing. Oh, yeah. Rangda is usually associated with Kalan Arang or Mahendra Datta, a 11th century queen consort of Bali when it was considered still a vassal princedom under the dominion of mainland Java. Okay. So Bali is part of Java, but is like a smaller island part of it. Makes sense. Mahendrata uh, was a princess uh, from mainland Java before she became a queen. So she was from mainland Java and then she moved to Bali when she married the king there. Mm -hmm. So she was a follower of the goddess Kali and Durga, who we've talked about in another episode. Uh, but in the case of Kali, she's the goddess of destruction and power. Uh, and in Durga's case, uh, she is the goddess of victory over good and evil. And in general, is this fierce warrior aspect of Parvati. I'm a big fan. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I feel like this. The, I feel like the early part of most spirits episodes. I'm like, yeah, no, dope, great, yes, okay. <laughs> so she gave birth to the famous Javanese hero king Eranga uh, in her 30s, which made people speculate that she had been married before and that Eranga was conceived through her former husband and therefore was not the king's true heir. People love to think about legitimacy, don't they? In they big, do. In big, big air quotes. Who does it matter really whose baby the baby is as long as it's being raised by a family that loves it? I know. And and I know there's like stuff about the uh, sacredness of the actual bloodline, but if if you believe that the line of rulers has like divine buy-in, then surely the god knows and is like, yeah, this person's cool. Like they're going to I don't know. I don't know. That's fair. I think that's fair, but again, creates some conflict within the story. So in Balinese traditions at the time, the cult of Durga was linked to sacrifice, black magic, and witchcraft. And Mahendrata uh, ended up being accused of, according to the legend, witchcraft, and therefore was exiled by her husband, thus becoming widowed. So not actually widowed, but widowed through divorce, basically. Sure. Hence Rangda getting her name, since the term Rangda is an old Javanese one for widow. Uh, so let me get this straight. She uh, existed over the age of 30 and had a child and therefore is excommunicated. Uh, therefore is a witch and was excommunicated. Okay. All right. All got, right. You got to include the witchcraft, obviously. <laughs> Honestly, doesn't feel that different to some family gatherings I've been to where they're like, whoa, Amanda, you've been graduated from college for a uh, checks watch four years now. What's going on? Whoa. Wild. Wild. <laughs> What are we doing with our lives? Oh, I'm just thinking about Thanksgiving now. Oh, no. Um, so in the email, Andrea says, quote, So it might be helpful to envision her as the Queen Circe of the 11th century Bali from a vastly more powerful family than her spouse, holding one of the most powerful offices in all the land, but still very much constrained by patriarchal structures. Her motives are sympathetic, but ultimately she is a villainess. Ooh. Damn, Andrea, bring in the yeah. research and the pros here. I love She's it. It's good. I, I really appreciate this email because ooh, a lot of a lot of my research was based off it and it's real good. And it reminds me of the woman in the butterfly lovers too, where just like powerful has so much energy and stuff to give and yet is being hemmed in by structures around her. Patriarchy man. 
I don't know. Um, so I should note that this version of the story uh, that was told after Mahendratta's death uh, and that she gained an unpopular depiction of herself later because of the unpopular view of Durga in Balinese traditions. But when she died in 1011 CE, so like not too long ago, but like not not recent, I suppose. Yeah, it's far back enough that like we could have an object that existed from that time, but also a long time ago. <laughs> uh, when she died then she was actually deified and was depicted as a form of Durga it was a form of Durga that was known as Durga as the slayer of the bull demon tell me about how she slayed a bull demon I didn't get too many details on that but <laughs> isn't that the dream don't worry about it demon not here anymore therefore we rejoice don't worry about it honestly you can deify me for pretty much anything I'll take it just just deify me. Yeah, I want to be... Actually, don't. Please imagine me complexly because I'm, I am I am a, a flawed person in a flesh prison doing my best. Um, if anything, the spirits episodes have taught us that we can imagine deities complexly. A. A. O. Okay. So in revenge for being ousted by her husband, Rangda curses the kingdom and her ex-husband's court. Hence the whole, like, Cersei villainous style kind of thing. Like, understandable, yes, but also still technically a villain. Yep. Um, so Rangda is seen in Balinese culture as a manifestation of rage and destruction. And in Barong dances, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, she appears to create extreme moods among the performers. It is said that sometimes the dancer embodying Rangda during the Barong will fall into a trance while performing. And Rangda's dance is significant too because it defies Balinese traditional dancing. She will stand with her legs apart, will tremble and spasm, and shake her long fingernails at her enemies. Ooh, damn, I love it. I'm definitely going to link a uh, a video of a Rangda in a uh, Barang because yes. it is really, really cool and honestly pretty creepy. That sounds awesome and reminds me uh, of when we were first learning about ancient theater, we learned about the worship of Dionysus because those two things are linked. Um, mm -hmm. And when I first heard this concept of a, a gauze specifically of, or deity related to the, the feeling of like otherworldly power and enrapturedness, rapturousness that uh, comes upon you when you are really losing yourself in music or art. I was just like, like exploding brain meme levels of like, oh my God, that makes so much sense. <laughs> oh man. I I love that because I, I don't know. It's just like very specific emotions being tied to gods makes me very, very happy. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, so Rangda's colors that are associated with her, uh, white, red, and black are also the same Those ones. Those are that the are only colors you need. They're also the ones associated with Kali. So, you know, it's already good. Yes. Um, if you look at the mask and imagery of Rangda, uh, they are very similar to Kali. She's got kind of the fanged mouth with the protruding tongue. And it's very much like a goading facial expression. Like it's got goading it. enemies into battle. Come at me. Um, come at me, bro. <laughs> she is also said to be the queen of the Liak. Uh, and these are creatures that take the form. Oh, you're going to love this one. These are creatures that take a form of a flying head with entrails attached. What? That is very creepy. They typically have a long tongue and long, sharp fangs. Uh, they are said to seek out pregnant women in order to suck the baby's blood or steal away the newborn child. Yikes. Um, they were said to once be humans who practiced black magic and cannibalism, and this practice transformed them into this horrifying form. I see how one could get from A to B. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yet, I mean... Black magic, I don't know. I, every person who practices black magic, I'm like, I bet your story is more interesting than people think it is. Oh, oh, buddy, we'll get there. We'll <laughs> get there. Oh, I love when you do that. Okay. <laughs> so they also are said to haunt graveyards as well, feeding on corpses, and they can change themselves into pigs and fly away. <gasps> Cute little flying piglets. Cute little flying piglets. Unless, unless they're like forest boars, in which case that's terrifying. Maybe both. Ooh. Ooh, now I'm curious. Because like, I mean, could you, be adorable piglet, could be horrifying boar with very sharp teeth. And depends where, like what graveyard, what kind of population density we're talking about there. 
Sure, sure, sure. So certain diseases and death can also be attributed to Leox, and they can be removed through a seance done by a Balian or a Balinese traditional healer. Okay, good. Got a, got a path forward. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about the dance between the Barong and the Rangda. Um, it is meant to symbolize the intertwining of good and evil, as well as showing the complex relationship between man and the supernatural. I mean, isn't that all of life and art? <laughs> that's what, that's yes. what we're trying to do here. Um, so I'll clarify that when we talk about Barong, we either mean the character, which is the protector spirit, the mask that is worn by the dancer, or the actual dance that is being done between Barong and Rangda. Okay. So it's a, it's multiple layer thing. So if I say Barong, I will try and clarify my best to you gotta say what I'm talking context about. Context clues, Doc. Yeah, I know, I know, but sometimes people get confused. I get confused. Thank you for giving us that uh that little prelim. Of course. Uh, so let me take a moment to describe how the dance, the barong, begins. Rangda enters, accompanied by several men who are armed with daggers called kris, uh, which are these sort of like ornate asymmetrical daggers that are found in Java and Indonesia. They're actually really, really beautiful, and they kind of have this like wavy pattern and Ooh. they're usually like carved in a certain way or etched i suppose and so the men enter with rangda and she influences them as part of the dance causing them to stab themselves with the chris but because of barong's presence the protector spirit they are protected from injury mm. uh, so because barong is eventually victorious in almost all of these dances uh, the village is protected and the people are protected. Uh, so this is really just a story of good versus evil, but that's not entirely it because it's it's better described, as I said at the beginning, as dharma versus adharma or yin versus yang. You know, neither is wholly good or wholly evil on their own, but they're these two parts of the same coin that need to be balanced out. Right. Barang, who is the protector of the village, is usually portrayed by two dancers under a hairy body. <laughs> like a paper mache type situation? Yeah, kind of like, I, I'll talk about it a little bit more, but you've seen the lion dances in Chinese yes. folklore? Yes. Uh, so dancers coordinate themselves, performing leaps and quickly turning legs as the dancer in the front operates the head and jaws of the barang mask. Man, they are predating a uh, war horse by centuries here. <laughs> Yes. Uh, like I mentioned before, the barong is influenced by the Chinese lion dances, which are typically performed during New Year's celebrations in China. But these dances also spread throughout Indonesia through trade and cultural exchange. Cool. Uh, the barong is not just a lion, though, but rather a combination of several animals, Amanda's favorite thing in the world. Okay, roll the dice, Julia. Let's go. Um, so there are different types of barong depending on what animals make it up. For example, a barang asu is a combination of a dog and a lion. A barang machan features tiger parts, and a barang lembu has the shape of a cow. Okay, not so bad yet. No, no, no. Pretty. They're not. They're not bad. This is a benevolent creature. It's not going to be super creepy. <laughs> oh, you set me up to expect it. <laughs> I know, but I just like to get you on your toes. They're not like the leox where they are just. Flying and trailheads. Uh, yeah. oh, yep. Uh, editor Eric uh, texted me early this morning to say that in the Facebook group, people were posting photos of animal mashups for me. So to mm -hmm. proceed with caution. And uh, that is my life now. And I am here. I accept my mantle. I have done this to myself. And uh, we'll get on with life. I really got to start tagging you in all of those posts. <laughs> I, I tend to read them all at once. But if it's going to be super terrifying or if Jim McDonald's is involved, uh, our, our BFF <laughs> and friend of the show. I, I will proceed with caution. <laughs> good, 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 good. So the barang represents the manifestation of virtue within the community. Uh, but not only that, because the barang is also considered sort of like a capricious and unpredictable creature. And it's because it's associated with uh, like aspects of the forest. And Andrea writes a really interesting part of the email that she sent uh, here. Both Rangda and Barang, to my knowledge, are associated with aspects of the forest. Rangda perhaps encapsulates the aspect of the forest that is the terrifying unknown place filled with the watching eyes and fang beasts waiting to devour you if you're not careful. Barang is the forest as a place teeming with life and protective sacred banyan trees. Ooh. For that reason, I always picture Barang as a friendly, fuzzy, Totoro-like forest creature. 
that's amazing. And it's true, right? Like you, you can't have the pretty parts of the forest without the danger too. That is true. Um, I think there's a lot of folklore that's kind of like that as, as many protective forest tree spirits we have in mythology there's always you know the the will of the wisp that is trying to lead people Mm -hmm. astray or the red caps or what have you that want to steal away people from the forest and suck them dry i don't know that that always got me too about uh about like persephone or like little red riding hood or any of these images we have of someone um like getting so close to nature or daring to move through it uh, that they're punished in some way. And ultimately, victorious through different means, depending on the version of these myths that you're talking about. But um, it, it always, like, it, when I initially read this stuff, I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, you dare to, like, have an interesting life and to, like, go places and do things, and and this is the danger that may befall you. Um, and I get how it's a cautionary tale, but also, I don't know, like, that's how adventure happens to you, is, is by trying things and doing stuff. Yeah, see, and that's interesting because one would argue it's like, oh, you're not meeting the societal standards of what your life is supposed to be and therefore you're going to get eaten by a wolf right? or or what have you. And it's super frustrating just from the, uh, the perspective of someone who wants to lead an interesting life and wants to stray from the path because I, I, I want to explore the, the paths that are untaken or less trodden, you know? Yeah, I mean, I've dealt with this too in, in just literal traveling, like convincing my parents, you know, that, that it would be okay for me to start traveling when I was in late high school and trying not to make them stay up late with worry, you know, going to different countries and continents in college. Uh, and ultimately, you know, I'm in Manhattan all the time, you know, like there's there's danger lurking everywhere. Um, growing up in, you know, post 9-11 New York, it's just kind of always on your mind. And you have to just weigh it and decide how much you know, not fear will hold you back, but how, how much caution and adventure it's, it is really a yin and a yang. And everyone has to, I think, draw that boundary for themselves. Yeah. It's all about keeping balance in your life. And as long as you're aware of the danger and what might be lurking around the corner, like you said, as long as you're aware of it, you know, you can, you can move forward. You shouldn't allow your fear of the unknown to kind of keep you trapped within your own safe spaces. Anyway, I want to learn more about this dance, Julie, but first I'm going to need a refill. Amanda, beep, 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 beep. Do you know what that is? No. That's the alert, the timer that I set because it's time to learn. Whoa. Uh, And you can learn pretty much anything if you go to Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with over 20,000 classes in design, business, technology, and more. And their premium membership gives you unlimited access to these high quality classes on must know topics so you can improve your skills, unlock new opportunities, and do what you love. Amanda, we're recording this after Thanksgiving. Yeah. Just this week, I was visiting my family for Thanksgiving. And you know what I discovered? Mm, What? Everyone loves magic. Everyone loves magic. Whoa. Seriously, people people love card tricks. It's they, totally a they thing. They do. It's, uh, it's a strong move to bust out at a party. So I checked out The Fundamental of Magic Tricks, and it's taught by a man named Hilar who has a very soothing voice and has also been a magician for 12 years. So he teaches you basically everything you need to know to get started with magic. Card magic, levitation, coin magic, mentalism. Whoa. Mind freak. And it's basically all of this cool stuff that you can use to impress people at parties and also keep your family members from talking about politics at the dinner table. That is a great, uh, a great and compelling reason to take this class. And is it Skillshare.com slash spirits where people can get two months of premium membership for 99 cents? It is. You can sign up by going to Skillshare.com slash spirits and getting two months of premium membership for just 99 cents. Thanks, Skillshare. Thanks, Skillshare. We can start learning today. Today, but after this episode. Yes. Our other sponsor this week is uh, a woman who has been beguiling me for years. It's my close personal friend, Mrs. Fields. Mrs. Fields, the, the cookie and candy and snack person. What's the weirdest thing you've ever gotten as a gift for the holidays? Um, one of my brother's ex-girlfriends once gave me a scarf that was identical to the one I was wearing at that time. Wow. Like I was unwrapping it and I was wearing a scarf that was exactly the same, which I don't know if that was like the worst gift or the best gift because she correctly like intuited that that was a color I would like. If I were her, I would not have given my, me the gift at all after seeing what I was wearing. But I, when I opened it, I was like, a backup. Amazing. But my question is, 
would you rather she had just given you cookies instead? I almost always wish that anyone gives me cookies instead of doing or saying anything. And Mrs. Fields is the one to go to. I made some cookie sandwiches the other day using Mrs. Fields cookies. We had a multitude business meeting and the catering was provided by Mrs. Fields in the form of delicious blondie, uh, like butterscotch blondies to go with our drinks. Oh my God, it was amazing. And that brings me to the most important part of this ad, which is my suggested cookie booze pairing for this box. Please tell me immediately. I need to know. So the Black Duck Porter is a delicious porter made by Greenpoint, a local brewery here to New York. And it pairs so well with the Butterscotch Blondie that I, eh, my mouth is salivating right now talking about it. I'm so hungry. Please tell me more. (laughs) And whether it's blondies, chocolate chip cookies, like frosted cookies, melt in your mouth brownies and blondies, Mrs. Fields, they have gourmet gift tins, they have baskets, they have individual cookies and sweets that you can buy. They're always baked daily and they arrive fresh and flavorful no matter where you are shipping across the U.S. And the best part is Mrs. Fields even offers a 100% customer satisfaction guarantee. It is as sweet as their cookies. Absolutely. And you can add a personal touch. You can put your own message, a logo, a family photo, whatever it is that you might want to add. So listen, if you need to send a gift to pretty much anyone, I think Mrs. Fields is the one to go with. So go to Mrs. M-R-S Fields dot com and enter promo code spirits when you check out to get 20% off any gift at Mrs. Fields dot com. And again, that is Mrs. Fields dot com. Promo code SPIRITS, 20% off any gift. Thanks again to Mrs. Fields. Thank you for letting us do a cookie booze pairing uh, in our ad because y'all are the best. Go to mrsfields.com, promo code SPIRITS. And now let's get back to the show. So Amanda, I want to tell you another story about Rangda. Oh, okay. Uh, and this is the fact that Rangda is associated with Kalon Arang, who is a legendary witch that was said to be wreaking havoc during the reign of the previously mentioned legendary king, Aranga. See, everything circles back around. Yay. If you give me some time, be I my can circle mom. everything. I, ooh, well, you'll see. Ha ha ha. Um, so, <laughs> I love the look on your face when you're like, herm, 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 my foreshadowing worked. Oh, so, uh, Kalona Rang uh, was a master of black magic, using it to cause damage to crops and cause disease across the island. Part of her lashing out against the community was because she had a beautiful daughter who could not find a husband because people were afraid of Kalona Rang. As revenge, she stole a young girl from the village and sacrificed her to Durga on a specific day, Kajeng Kliwan, or the Day of Black Magic. As a result, the village was flooded and a mysterious disease spread among the survivors. The king heard about the fate of this village and decided to ask one of his advisors to deal with the problem. The advisor, in turn, sent his disciple to marry Kalonarang's daughter. Once she was married and there was a huge feast that lasted seven days and seven nights that the whole village attended, the disease disappeared and everything returned back to normal. Okay. Pretty solid. Cool, cool, cool. Uh Uh-oh. But the new husband knew that Kalona Rang was a witch and stole her book full of magic incantations, the source of her magic. So Kalona Rang knew that the book was stolen and went to fight her new son-in-law, but because she could not access her power, she was defeated and the village was, quote-unquote, safe from her magic from then on. That's the end of the story? That's the end of the story. Oh, no. Uh, Also, uh, also, like, what does black magic mean exactly in this case? Uh, it doesn't specify. It's kind of one of those things where... Like a catch-all. Yeah, it's a catch-all kind of like, ooh, she was practicing dark magic. And it's it's not probably... It's probably just a misunderstood like religious practice or a folk magic of some sort. But people decide, ah, it's 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 different to the one and, I think is safe. Uh, she's following Durga and we don't like Durga. So, ah, Got basically. it. Well, that sucks. Um, It does. It totally does suck. But... Interestingly, there is an Indonesian poet named Toti Harati, uh, who in recent years has been portraying Kalona Rang and Rangda in a more sympathetic light. Yes! Uh, She characterizes her as a victim of demonization within the patriarchy. Uh, She has a poem that is a full-length book called Kalona Rang, the story of a woman victimized by patriarchy. Uh, And shout out to... uh, friend of the show Anne who was able to find me a translated copy of it online which I then bought for like five dollars for an ebook yay worth it totally worth it because it is 74 pages of just a full poem 
about Kalon Orang, and it's now my most treasured possession. Um, but the poem portrays Kalon Orang and Orangda as like three dimensional women who stand against the oppressive patriarchy but are perceived as a witch. So uh, I'm going to read the opening chapter of the book. Uh, bear with me because it's a little bit long, but I really do think it's going to be worth it. Okay? I'm ready. Yes. Uh, and I sent Amanda a copy so she can read along with me here. Yeah. All right. Kalon Arang, so people call her, Bali's symbol of evil, opposing Barang, his victory never assured, the witch's matted hair hanging loose, tongue protruding, fangs and claws grasping, pendulant breasts asway. She's just an old woman, a crone with anger overflowing. Ooh, wait, can we pause for one second? Yes, no, we can pause and break it down as we go, please. I mean, it is just, it is so clear that women who are not constrained within the roles of marriage uh, and can't be told what to do by a man, whether that's a father or a husband or a king or whatever, are are so clearly make people so uncomfortable and that yeah. is why we have like i mean she's she's portrayed almost like an like an animal here you know like yes. something that can sweep into your village cause havoc and then leave unconstrained by like the rules and and norms and uh, think about her name her name rangda literally just means widow yeah she it, it's her defining role in society is that she's no longer has a man and she's too old to marry again. I actually today saw the movie Widows, uh, which was fascinating. And I cannot wait to talk with you about it. Maybe as a patron bonus, we can talk about this on Patreon. I saw it over the weekend. I'm very excited. Oh, now. yes. Oh, good. Good, okay. good. Okay. So continuing on, uh, unless you have more things nope. to say. Her story begins with an outbreak of fear spreading through the village called Dera. The widow, Kalonarang, her magic powers so feared, nobody dared to court her beautiful daughter, Ratna Magali. So angry, the widow. So shamed, the widow. Kalonarang, in never-ending fury, spits fiery devastation from eyes, nose, mouth, and ears. The village of Dara in the 11th century lay in the kingdom of Daha, King Aranga's throne, at that time divided into Kadiri and Jingala, if this story is viewed within the sequence of history. But the myth is simple. There was a beautiful maid, a widow's daughter, who nobody dared to court. The angry widow wreaks disaster. A priest's son woos the daughter, disclosing his mother-in-law's secret, so the widow could be destroyed by the priest, all for the sake of King Arang's power. So the problem finds its solution in a myth of mother's love versus the state's power. Ah, freak it out. It's so good. Do you want to talk about it a little bit? No, I want more. Okay. But history is not as simple as that because we need scholars who study at Gajang Mada University writing theses, Kalon Arang in Balinese tradition, so titled because the story of Erlanda's kingdom had become Balinese, an analysis of Balinese script the manuscript of Kalon Arang has earned someone a doctorate in literature. Our cultural heritage has endowed an expert with the title of philologist. In Bali, Kalon Arang is called Niranga, Barong's adversary, yet another tale. Can this legend clarify the dilemma of the old woman? How many life cycles have passed us by until today? Only a horrifying tale remains, as if she, the widow, had no life story. She, who, as a young child, played in the village and grew into a lovely maiden, just like her daughter Ratna Malanga, thence widowed. What other disaster did befall her? Do you know what it is like to be a widow? Do you know what it means to be an old woman? Imagine if someone asked you these questions, who can give the right answer? Scientific textbooks mention only the life cycle of man, elaborated as one soul paradigm. Oh, Kalonarang, what an unhappy fate, an entire country punished for love's sake. But your own child betrayed you. For love, you became a fury. For love, you were destroyed by a priest. This is a problem between man and woman, also between widow and widower, 
the former statistics say seven times more numerous. There are young widows and wealthy widows both. Preyed upon by men, some luckily avoid consequence, even more difficult in times of unemployment. Among these widows, not young, not rich, there she was, Kalon Arang. It was not her, but her daughter who fell prey, her mother her only protector. Now I understand how she became a victim of patriarchy, anger and fury consuming her. No need for a holy priest, she burned with such vengeance, her brittle body engulfed by fire. Wow, I want to read this whole thing. I will send you a link to it. I'm very, Ugh. very happy with it. I mean, I'm just like, I'm scanning back over the stances that you read and it's, I, I love the like meta textual, like I love poems that talk about poems. I love, you know, books that, that examine what it means to write a book and write one in this kind of tradition, whatever it is. Um, but this is so, uh, I'm at a loss for words almost. Uh, I will say that the, uh, the publication of this is also, um, is also illustrated so there's a, a small little picture on every page and the imagery that they use for Kalon Arang is really, really evocative and really, really fascinating. Yeah, like this is so clearly seen as an evil narrative, right? Or like a narrative of destruction by people who have the like privileges of richness or youth or uh, gender or marriage that legitimizes quote unquote like being a woman um, and without those tools you know this is like Rangta story sounds like any kind of movie we see where a down on their luck hero you know decides to like break rules and make things right and like seek justice despite the the costs um, and it's just it looks different because she occupied the body of an older woman um, without the like trappings of wealth or or societal you know heritage to make her worth listening to in the eyes of most people. Yeah, the lens that I was looking at this story through um, is one that I've been kind of feeling a lot personally, um, and it's this idea that like sometimes I just have these moments where I feel like I'm the villain in someone else's story. Do you Oof. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, where there's just like certain people in life that kind of make you feel like your feelings are not valid because they don't align with the way that other people feel. Or they exist at and, all. <laughs> and there's yeah. no space for feeling in a world that's driven by, you know, accomplishment or accumulation of wealth or or compliance. Yeah. And this is something that I associate with um, because I'm someone who has ADHD. Uh, but one of the symptoms of that is something called rejection sensitivity. And it's basically this idea of like, I'm very hard on myself because when other people are hard on me, I take it very, very hard. Mm hmm. Um, and so reading the story of Rangda and specifically the way that Toti Harati kind of tells the story, she absolutely does some morally objectionable things. Like she kills a child. She makes a entire village flood and kills people with disease and ruins their crops and stuff. That's not good things that are done. Right. Um, but she's lashing out because of the rejection she faces from that society. And so I feel as though Toti Harate really captures in that poem that she writes about Rangda and Kalona Rang that when society, whether it actually is or in your perception, is against you, it's natural that people would want to lash out. And I think that like when we see injustice kind of in an ideal situation, when we see injustice, we want to be able to fight back. We don't right. want to feel helpless. We want to feel as though we can do something. And those consequences will impact those who have wronged us. I want to embody that anger that burns inside of Rangda because so often in a patriarchal society, we aren't allowed to feel that way. Yeah, and a lot of really, really smart journalists have written about how this sort of idea is also helping to form the political moment that the U.S. and a lot of other places are in, where people who feel justly or unjustly uh, ignored or maligned um, lash out. And that looks like, you know, xenophobia. That looks like reactionism. That looks like nationalism. That looks like hatred against all kinds of groups of people that may be thought to be your enemy. Um, yeah. And I don't like I find myself almost wanting to look away when I see examples of people in such grief 
uh, whether that's over a loss of a, a child, a home, a state, like when, when the loss is so big, you know, I want to look away because it's, it's like too much to handle. Um, but I'm, I'm really trying to challenge myself to, to sit in that. Um, and not just in my own feelings, um, you know, where the, the feeling is big and I want to push it down and squish it away and distract myself yeah. with something else. Um, and sometimes you have to for survival, but I, I'm trying really hard to, to look into that um, because I don't know, like, even though, you know, there are lots of ways in which I am complicit in other people's suffering and that doesn't go away by ignoring it um, and yeah. looking at, you know, refugees or people who have lost so much more than I can even think about, I have to think about it and I might not be able to totally get it, but I really want to hold myself at least to, to give them the, the courtesy and like dignity of trying. That's such an interesting perspective to look at. So I'm curious, do you think that in these kind of situations, uh, like if we look at Rangda and Kalona Rang, what are we supposed to do to help those people who are being persecuted besides like potentially use our voice in a way that doesn't silence them? I don't know. I mean, I think to to listen and to try to understand. Um, I'm drawn over and over again to stories with like antiheroes um, mm -hmm. or with people who, you know, are thought to be, you know, a villain, but actually have their own motivations. And whenever you can, you know, it's a comic books all the time where like the villain mm -hmm. that you followed for dozens of issues, you suddenly start to see their backstory. Um, and then, you know, you come to understand and not excuse what they're doing, but to understand how a person can get from A to B. And I just think every time I see something like that, it's it's like expanding my own capacity to, to like understand what human beings can do and how, you know, how important it is to reach out and to try to empathize and do those small acts of courtesy and kindness and community building um, that are easy to overlook, especially, you know, living in a gigantic city like this with my headphones on every day. It's it's easy not to um, not to engage and to look up and make eye contact because I don't know, it's that that's what it looks like a lot of the time to me. It's not just informing myself and, you know, donating to causes and voting, but um, just trying really hard to to engage with the people around me. Uh, even when I'm tired, even when it's hard, even when it's raining and I have my headphones on. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it helps, but I like to think it does. Yeah. And I think that when, when facing a certain amount of persecution or perceived persecution, the, the two kind of instinctual ways that people react to it is either by lashing out, like we see in the story of Karana Rang, um, or, um, just a feeling of hopelessness. Right. And sometimes it's it's hard to, it, I, I find a lot of times I tend to numb myself and kind of fall into that feeling of hopelessness, which is why the idea of Kalonarang lashing out it appeals to me so much. Yeah. Because that's just well, like not that, who I am as a person. It's that yin and yang, right? Like it's, yeah. it's those two things that, that fall together. And it, it yeah. just, yeah, it, like it seems so it seems so dangerous to me to feel a feeling that big. Um, and I like, I, I at a part of the way that I experience my, you know, d depression and stuff is like uh, small things that should not make me feel like quote unquote, should not make me feel devastated, devastate me. Um, and so I have not experienced a lot of emotions that did not like completely devastate and destroy me. <laughs> you know, like I, yeah. I, it, it's, that's part of the, part of the thing is that there, there are very few just like, medium sadnesses. Um, and so, you know, in my, in my recovery and, and my wellness, like that's part of what I'm trying to do is, is realize that feeling uncomfortable is not going to kill me again, whether that's like in service to someone or just allowing myself to process and to feel, uh, you know, the injustice of something bad that happened to me or the sadness and empathy at the suffering of a, a friend or family member. Um, it's, it's very, very challenging. And I don't know. I don't know. I don't have the answers. I just, I, I really, kind of think that the way that you just described how like there's no small feeling all of your feelings are large reminds me of the last line of Toti Harati's uh thing uh where it's just for for a holy priest she burned with such vengeance her brittle body engulfed in fire and like just the the feeling that your emotions can just kind of erupt out of you and consume all of you is like something that I I can 
kind of relate to and something I, I feel like I feel like sometimes my anger gets the best of me and it kind of takes over everything that I'm feeling in that moment. Um, and it's probably my own um, my own mental health issues and my own neuroses that kind of make me fall into that category. But it's it's something that I just I wish I could do something with. You know, instead of just feeling that burning, I want to direct it towards something. Yeah. And the easiest target is just destruction of everything around you, right? Like that's, yeah. you know, that that really is. And I, I love this last uh, kind of couple lines as well, because it juxtaposes, you know, no need for a holy priest. Like, you you know, there is there is not a need to go through a like previously channeled conduit and the trappings of, you know, like organized religion and um and and ritual because there is enough within her that she can connect to whatever it is you know uh herself yeah. um and it's that you know it's it's passion <laughs> like it it really is so um so much the story of a person on the outside of a system uh trying to reform it burn it down deal with it live you know um and in this case it looks like destruction and it's interesting too. Um, I, it might just be my reading of it, but it also I think it implies that, you know, the story ends with her being burned by the priest, and they're saying there's no need for that. She she can burn all on her own, right? And so like the idea that um, what would be her destruction, she is creating into a destructive force in return, is just like oh man, that is like the gene gray is the phoenix levels of <laughs> like emotional like plot point and emotional arc to me yeah i thought the same thing in the uh early in the poem where they're talking about um in never-ending fury spits fiery devastation from eyes nose mouth and ears Oof. that made me think of uh of like plague and and diseases where if they're very bad you know you stuff comes out of places <laughs> and, and yes especially thinking of plague in particular or disease as a, a means of her revenge again awful like not not excusable um and i think that the the like poetic justice of you know i, I don't know like there's something about like being being like overflowing that seems to be a, a motif here where you're overflowing yeah. with with rage with power with you know, desire to act and to be independent and the avenues that you want to go down are not available to you. So you freaking flood it. Like, you know, you, you figure out a way, you know, that kind of, that kind of, of emotion will out. Yes. Um, I think Andrea's uh, title of uh, cool motive, still murder, but for this story is, is very much valid. Um, but or perhaps end, um, I think <laughs> that we can learn a lot from Rangda about how we utilize our desire to destroy, I suppose. Yeah. Our desire to revolt against the patriarchy and the, um, the things that bind us into a position that we don't want to be in. Yeah, like civility is a tool of the state. You know what I mean? Like, yes, uh, conforming to a society's rules is a tool of the formers of that society to keep the status quo the way it is. Mm -hmm. Cool motive, still murder is a great is a great phrase because it you can have a cool motive and it's still murder, right? Like, like you can mm -hmm. you can have very good reasons for doing what you're doing and it can still be you know a crime depending on or you know morally objectionable, however you want to define it. Um, but I like that's something that again a lot of people have written really eloquently about in the last two years is like don't let go of your anger and don't let you don't let civility stand in the way um like as a as a white person i try not to let my discomfort about bringing up and challenging people who make racist remarks in my presence it's uncomfortable it's like you know uncivil it's disrupting the peace or whatever um and it is completely necessary to do and, you know, justice and education are way more important than the civility of like the dinner table or ruining the holidays, you know, if, if it has to come down to that. Um, yeah, it's it's hard. It's hard. And it's so much easier to be peaceful and nice and, uh, you know, with with big quotes um, and not to draw attention to yourself. And again, it can be an issue of safety sometimes. But uh, like wearing my little rainbow pin on my on my coat, you know, is is a little act of incivility uh, and. Yeah refusing to laugh at a joke that would be easy to laugh off is a little act of disobedience 
Um, and it's, it's one that I, I think I'm going to enjoy having, uh, Rangda's kind of example and that image of her, you know, frail and small and combusting as a bit of motivation. Absolutely. Uh, and I will leave that with our listeners, uh, a reminder to perhaps, uh, take your active incivility and, uh, make the world a better place using it. And to remember to stay creepy. Stay cool. Unless you're on fire, then you're cool afterward. Yeah, cool down. (laughs) Take that cool down period. (laughs) Thanks again to our sponsors this week, Skillshare and Mrs. Fields. Go to Skillshare.com slash spirits to get two months of premium membership for 99 cents. And go to MrsFields.com. Use the promo code spirits when you check out for 20% off any gift. Thanks again. Spirits was created by Amanda McLaughlin, Julia Shafini, and Eric Schneider, with music by Kevin McLeod and visual design by Allison Wakeman. Keep up with all things creepy and cool by following us at Spirits Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr. We also have all of our episode transcripts, guest appearances, and merch on our website, as well as a form to send us your urban legends at spiritspodcast.com. Join our member community on Patreon, patreon.com slash spiritspodcast for all kinds of behind the scenes stuff. Just one dollar gets you access to audio extras with so much more available too. Recipe cards, director's commentaries, exclusive merch, and real physical gifts. We are a founding member of Multitude, a collective of independent audio professionals. If you like spirits, you will love the other shows that live on our website at multitude.productions. And above all else, if you liked what you heard today, please share us with your friends. That is the very best way to help us keep on growing. Thank you so much for listening. Till next time.